Welcome back, everybody. Let's continue to talk about the three different measures of central tendency, noting their strengths and their weaknesses along the way. So far, we've talked about the mode, which is the most common score. And we've talked about the median, which is the midpoint or the geometric average. This time, let's talk about the mean, which is the arithmetic average. In other words, it's the average based on simple arithmetic. Remember, arithmetic is addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. I'm going to explain this graphic in a minute, but it helps you understand that the mean balances the distribution. The two sides of the distribution aren't necessarily equally sized. Here you can see there are two scores, but over on this side there are three scores, but they are equally weighted. Let me show you what I mean by that. For those of you who don't remember, this is mu, M-U. It's the symbol that we use when we compute a mean for an entire population. This population is obviously very small. There are only one, two, three, four, five different scores. And we can see that the mean equals five. When I say that the distribution is equally weighted on each side of the mean, it's easiest to see that when we look at what we call deviation scores. I'm going to look at every single one of those scores individually and see how much it differs or deviates from the mean. We'll start right here with this score of number one. A score of one is four points from the mean, so the deviation score is four. A score of two is three points from the mean, so the deviation score is three. A score of six is one point from the mean, there are two scores of six. And a score of 10 is five points from the mean, so the deviation score is five. So when I say that the mean, which is the arithmetic average, equally weights both sides of the distribution, this is what I mean. Four plus three equals seven, five plus one plus one equals seven. So remember, we're talking about different measures of central tendency. This is the way that the mean is the center of the distribution. And check this out, here's some good news. The mean is mathematically derived. In other words, there is a formula for the mean. I guess technically we'll be looking at two different formulas for the mean. One for a population mean, mu, and one for a sample mean, which we can write with an M or an X bar. We're going to focus on X bar. So just think about it, you know how to compute a mean. You simply add up all of the scores and then divide by the number of scores. Well, written in summation notation, we can write the sum of x, that just means add up all the scores, and then divided by n, divide by the number of scores. If we're dealing with an entire population, we divide by a capital N, because a capital N represents the number of scores in a population. However, if we're dealing with a sample of scores, then we divide by a small n, a lowercase n. But still, we're just adding up all the scores and dividing by the number of scores. I alluded to this next point in our last video when we talked about the median. I said all things being equal, the mean will be our default measure of central tendency. Overall, we like it the best of the three options. One of the main reasons that we really like it is that it represents the data really well. Unlike the other measures of central tendency, every single score is used to compute the mean. In other words, every single data point contributes to the sum of x. And every single data point contributes to n. So every single data point has its say in the final answer. You can't say that for the mode, and you can't say that for the median. And, of course, another key reason that the mean is our default measure of central tendency is because it's mathematically derived. Being mathematically derived, having an actual equation to back it up, means that we can build upon it. And in fact, we're going to build upon it right away you'll see that we will use it for more advanced statistical analyses. Even in the next chapter of our course, when we start talking about variability, the measure of variability that we will like best is called the standard deviation. And what does the standard deviation measure? It measures, on average, how much the different scores differ from the mean. So in that case, we use the mean as a baseline for measuring variability in our data. Let's talk about some characteristics of the mean. I mentioned before that every single score adds to the sum of x, and every single score adds to n. Let's just play a few games with some quiz scores to make sure we understand how the mean reacts when we make different changes. Let's pull out our calculator just to help us out. 
Of course, if we want to compute the mean, we can use this basic formula. x bar, which represents a sample mean, can be found by simply taking the sum of x and dividing by n. So let's compute the sum of x real quickly, just to make sure everybody's on board. We'll take 6, we'll add 8, we'll add 5, we'll add 7, and then we'll add 4. Now you should be following along using your own calculator. That equals 30. So the sum of x is 30. We simply want to divide that by our n. Our n is the number of scores that we have. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 30 divided by 5 equals 6. Let's walk through the following questions and just talk about the logic behind what we would expect to find. What would happen if we needed to change the 8 to a 10? So, for example, maybe we find out that this score right here is incorrect. If we're changing the 8 to a 10, that means we're now using a score that is two points higher. So what's going to change? Is the sum of x going to change? Yes. The sum of x is going to go from 30 to two points higher, which is 32. Is the n going to change? No. We have not added a score. We have not deleted a score. n is still 5. So the new mean is going to be 32 divided by 5, which in this case is 6.4. So one thing we're noticing here, if we change a score to a larger value, the mean is going to increase. It increased from 6 to 6.4. So we can assume that the opposite is going to happen in this situation. What would happen if we changed that 8 from the original data set to a 5? Now we're changing it to a score that's three points lower. So is the sum of x going to change? Yes, it's going to change to a value three points lower. 30 minus 3 equals 27. Is the sample size going to change? No, we just changed the value of one number. We didn't eliminate a number, we didn't add a number. So our n is still equal to 5. So if we take 27 and divide by 5, our new mean is 5.4. And as predicted, the new mean is a value lower than 6. What would happen if we added a new score, a 10, to the list? First of all, if we're adding a score that's higher than the mean, I'm expecting the new mean to be higher than 6. And think about this too. The sum of x is going to change because we're adding 10 points, but n is going to change as well because we're adding another score. So if the sum of x was equal to 30 previously, we now need to add 10 points to that. It'll now equal 40. And if n was equal to 5 previously, and we're adding one more value, now n equals 6. So the new mean can be found by taking 40 and dividing by 6, which equals 6.67 that value is indeed larger than 6. And then finally, what would happen if we removed 7 from that original list? If I'm going to take away a value that's larger than the mean, the mean is going to have to go down in value. So let's think about this. The sum of x is clearly going to change. If the sum of x was equal to 30, and now we're going to subtract 7 points from that, the sum of x now equals 23 n used to be based on five different data points. Now we only have four different data points. So 23 divided by 4 should give us our new mean. And our new mean, we're predicting, is going to be lower than the value of 6. And indeed, it equals 5.75. So make sure you understand how the mean will react when there are changes to our data set. As we're manipulating our data, as we're collecting more data, as we're making corrections to our data, we should have a sense of how those changes are going to affect the results of our statistical analyses. Let's talk a little bit more about some characteristics of the mean. Here's a fun fact. If we add, subtract, multiply, or divide every single score in our data set by some constant value, the mean will change in exactly the same way. Let's prove that to ourselves. We're going to replicate this right here. You've probably done conversions in the past, for example, between inches and centimeters. So you probably remember that one inch equals 2.54 centimeters. So if I have a bunch of original measurements in inches, I would have to multiply each one of those by 2.54 centimeters if I'm going to have a data set in centimeters. And we've learned that if we multiply every single score by some constant, the mean should change in exactly the same way. Let's see if that's true. All right, here are the original measurements in inches. Let's take each one of those measurements and multiply by 2.54 so we can figure out how many centimeters the measurement is equivalent to. So I don't have to keep flipping back and forth to my online calculator. I'm just going to use my hand calculator. You can go ahead and do that along with me. 
So I'm going to key in 10 inches and then multiply by 2.54. That equals 25.4. Now let's take 9 inches and multiply by 2.54. That equals 22.86. Now let's take 12 inches and multiply by 2.54. That equals 30.48 centimeters. Now we're going to take 8 inches and multiply by 2.54. That gives us 20.32 centimeters. And finally, let's take 11 inches and multiply by 2.54, and that converts into 27.94 centimeters. 27.94. Now we want to compute the sum of x because ultimately we want to compute a new mean. So let's add up all those values. 25.4 plus 22.86 plus 30.48 plus 20.32 plus 27.94 equals 127. So the sum of x now equals 127. Let's just play with that number for a minute. Remember, every single one of these values was multiplied by 2.54. So this sum of x should be 50 times 2.54. Let's check that out. Let's take 50 and multiply by 2.54. Yep, it equals 127. Let's find the new mean. We have two, four, five different values that we measured. So we're going to take 127 and divide by our sample size, which is 5. That equals 25.4. And that should make sense, because if we took the old mean, 10, and then we multiplied that by 2.54, we would get a new mean of 25.4. So what we just proved to ourselves is that if we take every single score and multiply by a constant value, the original mean will be multiplied by that constant value as well. And that's because if we add, subtract, multiply, or divide every single score by a constant, the mean will change in exactly the same way. Let me give you a really simple example of where that information about the mean would be very helpful. Let's assume for a minute that your class took the first exam and on average your class scored 72. But let's say that's lower than what I would typically expect because I was expecting a mean of about 80. What could I do to curve the scores? What can I do to make the new mean for the class 80? Now, typically, I would never just give away points. But for this example, let's say there was some type of compelling reason where I thought it was my fault that you guys did poorly on the exam. So what could I do to all of your scores to make it so the mean goes from 72 to a mean of 80? Think about what we just learned. If we add, subtract, multiply, or divide every single score in the distribution by some constant value, the mean will change in exactly the same way. So if I want the mean to be 8 points higher, I could give every single student 8 extra points. If I added 8 points to every single student's score, the resulting new mean would be 8 points higher. Now, I do love the mean, and we will be working a lot with the mean, but truth be told, the median and the mode will work in exactly the same way, as long as we're dealing with measurement data. All right, we've reached that point where now we're going to talk about what we like and what we don't like so much about the mean, which is simply the arithmetic average. One thing that I really like about the mean is that it's based on every single score in the distribution. Unlike the mode, unlike the median, in order to compute the mean, you use every single score. If every single score has a say in the final answer, the final answer is probably representative of the entire group of data. We've talked at length about how the mean is mathematically derived, and as a result, it's going to be the basis for more advanced statistical procedures. You're going to see, my friends, we're going to be using the mean all semester long, and we're going to learn all kinds of sophisticated inferential statistical tests. What's going to be the basis for all those tests? The mean. So I'm not lying to you when I say it's our default measurement of central tendency. The mean does have a couple drawbacks. In order to compute a mean, 
Remember, we typically get an answer that has some type of fractional component. Fractional components like that only make sense when we have equal intervals between each data point. So the mean really only makes sense when we have interval or ratio level data. When we have data that we can order, ordinal data, we know the median will work out pretty well for us. And when we have nominal level data, just names of categories, we know that the mode will work out pretty well for us. So every measure of central tendency that we've discussed has its appropriate time and place. And here's the biggest problem with the mean. It's extremely influenced by outliers. When there are outliers in our data, the mean will chase after those outliers. So in those situations, the mean might not represent the center of the distribution very well. Well, there you have it, my friends, a good summary of the mean, the median, and the mode. I've got one more video that I want to share with you about central tendency. In that video, we'll discuss where we would expect to find each one of those measures of central tendency in various distributions. So I'll see you in the next video. Until then, be safe.